Welcome to New York Bio's virtual breakfast series, a digital program started in 2020, bringing you fireside chats with leaders across the healthcare spectrum. This week's episode features Brad Longcar, CEO of Longcar Investments. And good morning. My name is Jennifer Hawksland, and I'm the CEO at New York Bio. We are thrilled you're joining us for another edition of our virtual breakfast series. Um, Today, we um, are joined by Brad Longcar, and we are going to talk all things biotech investing, um, his um, early, early look at um, doing some very innovative ETFs, and what he sees next for the market. Um, in fact, um, as always, I almost always forget this, housekeeping. Please, we know you're going to have questions for Brad. You want to see what's in his crystal ball. So ask those in the chat or the Q&A, and Derek and I will get to them throughout the course of the conversation. Um, I cannot let this um, personal privilege go by to remind you all to register next Wednesday. So a week from tomorrow, we have our New York Bio annual meeting um, that will be in Midtown Manhattan. We hope you'll join us. Um, so go to our website and register if you haven't already. There is a discount code for virtual breakfast attendees. Um, so be sure and check that out. Uh, with that, um, oh, special thank you to our sponsor for this month's series of breakfast, VWR. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Derek to kick off our conversation with Brad. Thanks, everybody. All right, Brad, good morning. How are you? It's great to have you. We think of you, I think of you every single time for this show when we have the, our stock exchange event roll around, because I think there are few people, if any, that kind of sit right in the middle of really both where the market is going, where innovation is happening, and, you know, kind of the pulse of, of biotechnology really across the globe. So we're thrilled to have you here. Um, we tend to start things off with a bit of an origin story. So why don't you introduce yourself and tell people kind of how you got where you are today? Yeah, so thanks a lot for having me. And congratulations to both of you on doing over 100 of these. I know how much work goes into that. Um, that's a really incredible milestone. And um, I'm happy to, to be here uh, this morning participating in one. Yeah, so I'm a biotech investor. Uh, I live, I'm in Kansas City this morning. That's that's where I was born and raised and where I live now. And um, my first job out of college was at a big mutual fund company. I, I'm a finance guy, by the way. I, I I've always been a science nerd. I actually started college pre-med, but I love biology and I hated chemistry. Um, <laughs> and at my school, pre-med was kind of a weed out major. And I think I got weeded out. I switched over <laughs> to finance. Um, but I've always still tried to, you know, marry the two. And, and that's why I've been just like personally focused um, in biotech. So I manage a very small family office for my own family here in Kansas City. And I focus on biotech because that's what I love. And having worked at a mutual fund company, um, one thing that's happened in the stock market over like the last 20 years is mutual funds are going away and being replaced by ETFs. Um, ETFs are just better products. They trade on the stock exchange so you can buy and sell them instantaneously. They have lower fees, they're more tax efficient, they're just better products. And um, as this ETF revolution has been happening over that time, one thing I noticed is that there's not, there hadn't been a lot of great biotech ETFs. Um, like even if you're not a stock market person, you probably know that the main gauges for the biotech sector are the IBB and the XBI. Um, that's kind of how we track our performance as a sector. But besides those, there's a handful of, of ETFs, but they're all very broad and hard for the general public to really understand. Um, so I kind of caught the entrepreneurial bug. And, you know, as we all know, there's so many cool things within biotech, you know, so much great science happening, whether whether it's gene therapy or immuno-oncology or, you know, all the advances in neuroscience today. So I wanted to create funds that allow people to invest in those things specifically. Um, mm -hmm. So as uh, I launched one uh, uh, seven years ago called the Cancer Immunotherapy ETF, that's CNCR, it trades on the NASDAQ. And it's a basket of, you know, CAR-T and Checkpoint and, you know, immuno-oncology stocks. And so it helps non-biotech experts invest in that without having to take the risk 
of, you know, putting too much money into one company, or, you know, they might not even know the companies, but want to invest in that theme. So, so that was kind of like a trial balloon. I wasn't sure if that was going to be like too narrow for the public to really understand and like get excited about. And it's been a moderate success. And so my goal is to have five or six funds like that one day that allow people to invest in, you know, the key areas of our sector. <laughs> um, and so a handful of years ago, I was in a position to launch fund number two. And I'm super excited about China. I think there's a biotech revolution happening there. And so my second fund is called the China Biopharma ETF. Mm -hmm. That's CHNA. It trades on the NASDAQ as well. So I'm kind of uh, working hard to make those two funds a success and hopefully on my journey to having, you know, five or six funds that really focus on those interesting growth areas of our, of our sector. Brad, well, how do you, oh, oh, go, go ahead, Jared. Yeah, I was going to say, if you think about it, if you wind back to 2015, it's, it's kind of easy to think about how big immunotherapy is now, but in 2015, it, it wasn't, right? This was kind of, if I'm benchmarking it, it was really probably on the heels of you know, Optiva Keytruda approval, right? And there was a lot of excitement around, I guess what we'll call next generation checkpoint inhibitors or other things you could pair with, with PD-1, but those were, were uncertain at the time at best. And if I remember right, it was, I don't know if, the, if we had a, CAR, a CD-19 CAR-T approval yet, but we had a lot of those in the pipeline, maybe some clinical results, but really like second generation CAR-T wasn't even there yet. So yeah. I, I think really the incredible thing is there was the, the zeitgeist in and around the, the people in science kind of figured this was going to be the next big thing, but nobody really, you know, to your credit, had any idea how to invest in it because it was so broad. You didn't know who was going to be in there. You had all of these companies, like every series A company was another checkpoint inhibitor, inhibitor, another PD-1 plus company, right? So what was it like to try and get that off the ground? Did you either, do you have to kind of drum up market support for these? How do you kind of get the demand side of the ETF to even know you want to put it together? Yeah. So, you know, if you go back even a few years before then, before the checkpoints came along, if you believed in IO, people thought you were nuts. Nuts. Um, oh, crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, you know, were a people. Dendrion believer. Yeah. I mean, people have been working on IO for literally a hundred years. Like that's yeah. not an exaggeration. Right. And um, there's been a lot of failures. And in 2015, when I launched this, the checkpoints were around, but the CAR-Ts had not been approved yet. And you know, fast forward to to today, Keytruda is the largest selling drug in the world. Um, in terms of demand, so my funds are not for biotech people. Um, my funds are more for like financial advisors and the general public. And, you know, the whole idea behind them is it helps people invest in this who might not be able to invest in it on their own. And so right. I spent a lot of time on the road. Um, you know, you go to a city and, you know, you have a breakfast, a lunch and a dinner, at like different investment firms, just educating them on biotech and, and that topic. And so it's really kind of organic, just like pounding the pavement um, and trying to educate people myself. And yeah, it's amazing how that field has, you know, played out over time to have I think it's underappreciated, like how amazing the CAR T products are in multiple myeloma. Um, they're really going to revolutionize um, that disease. And mm -hmm. in lymphoma, uh, you know, this year there was a landmark approval. They went head to head against stem cell transplants and actually beat them. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of people that doubted CAR T and, and assumed it would be a niche treatment for very late stage patients. And to have it moving up in earlier lines of, of treatment is, you know, really an incredible thing. Now, it hasn't been all good, um, to be fair. There's been a lot of disappointments along the way, too. Like, you know, like you said, all of those Series A companies, when the, when the PD-1 succeeded, everyone thought it was going to be easy to add another immuno-oncology drug on top of those and sadly, that's pretty much been failure after failure after failure. And, and this year, we saw that with the Tigit um, drugs. So we're still really crossing our fingers 
that that's going to happen, but there's also been, especially in that checkpoint combo space, mm -hmm. a lot of disappointments in the in the field as well, unfortunately. Yeah. Oh, I was just gonna say, take us back a step though. Like, so we obviously like within our community, we have investors, we have entrepreneurs, right? That that are interested, right? In accessing the mar the public markets. Talk to us about how you even decided which companies to put in the ETF, because I'm guessing you didn't choose a, I mean, I know this because I looked it up, but you don't have Merck, right? Which has Keytruda, but has lots of other products as well. Yeah, actually we do have Merck. Um, oh, you do? Yeah, so so most ETFs, mine included, are what's called passive investing. They're based off of an index. So <clears throat> I'm not like trading stocks every day or changing the companies every day like an active manager would be. Basically, the idea is I try to design them so that you can play the field, so to speak. And so that particular one, the index, has 30 companies and so it's more or less like the 30 largest companies um, that are focused on immuno oncology. And five of them are like the Mercs and Bristols of the world. But like, you know, it's so pervasive today that you could include like every big pharma company in yeah. there if, if you did that. And we limit that to five. And then we have 25 that are kind of the pure play, cell therapy, you know, oncolytic virus, you know, type companies like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. Yes, I didn't view the view all on the, <laughs> on the fund page. <laughs> no I was like, worries. wow, this is a really small fund, <laughs> like a number of companies wise. Yeah. Um, but, but that makes a lot of sense. And do you find that that makes more retail investors more comfortable if the um, the risk and obviously the potential reward is spread out over a broader basket? Yeah, absolutely. That's, you know, that's the idea is biotech is volatile and risky. And even the best companies in our industry have major setbacks. Um, and so it's very difficult for a non-biotech expert to really appreciate that risk. And so to be able to spread it out amongst 30 different holdings, you know, makes it a little safer, I think. So it's it's interesting. You had said before we're now seeing the readout on on Tidget and a few of these other things, and it strikes me that the there is there's kind of almost a long tail of failure, if you will, because when I was doing immuno oncology in 2015, and I think we had a, a Tidget inhibitor, we had a few of these, and so we're now kind of only seeing the clinical shakeout out of Gen two. And the interesting thing is is in that time, I remember that the the biological theses of you know, you had to get the macrophages, you know, you had to do something with the macrophages on the outside of the tumor. And the interesting thing is for that period, the understanding of biology and immunology and cell types moved much faster than anyone could in terms of targets or any other sorts of biology. I think that's probably slowed down a little bit now, but now when you think about things like CRISPR and when you think about the number of tools that we have um, as an industry, even even just the massive volume of sequencing, um, it's almost like this disconnect between where the uh, the actual science moves and how quickly companies can move. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think one thing, one conclusion I've come to over all this time with some of those failures is, I don't think the answer to the problem is two checkpoints. Um, yeah, you know, that's failed way too many times. I think. What's ultimately going to succeed is something like oncolytic virus um, plus checkpoint, you know, things like that, that, you know, target different aspects of the immune system, like the innate and adaptive immune system. Yeah. The other thing, too, is that we're getting, I, I hope we're getting a little bit better at picking which patients we believe are going to succeed. And that's been a, a massively kind of stepwise and iterative process for all of these companies are the response rate stillness isn't necessarily there but again it's one of these things where you know after you launch a clinical trial you can't just kind of change it in the middle so it, it's a lot of credit to really the mercs and the bristols of the world to kind of dig in all the corners that they can to figure out you know okay which basket of patients are we actually going to get to respond here yeah and another thing that's really important is learning from failures this is something that jim allison has talked a lot about um one thing, sadly, that has not been happening like it should is with all of these trials and all of these companies doing these things, when they fail, 
you know, do biopsies and, uh, you know, try to really learn after the fact, you know, what happened and why it failed. And that hasn't been happening to the degree that, that mm -hmm. it should be. And so, you know, hopefully, hopefully more people will start doing that in the future. Yeah, um, it's difficult. Go ahead, Jennifer. No, 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 go ahead. And then I'm going to ask a question from the audience. I was going to say, it's, it's one of these structural difficulties of where the capital comes from to that, right? You kind of, you know, it's, it's difficult for a company to turn around afterwards and say, okay, now we're going to really dig and find out what happened when most people, you know, it's, it's kind of like the end of the Maltese Falcon, right? They take the thing out, it's not the Maltese Falcon, and they move on to the next, they, they run out of the room and move on to the next thing. And I've been waiting roughly a year to use that Maltese Falcon reference in biotechnology on this program. <laughs> Um, but it's one of my favorite things when they, they everyone everything moves very quickly. As soon as we've decided that something isn't, you know, biologically relevant, they go they go for the next one. So it's hard to it's hard to know whose whose function that is, right? It, I, I think it would be super valuable, but it's hard to know who does it. The um, we actually had a question from the audience, um, and it says, "What are the nuts and bolts of actually setting up an ETF once you know what stocks you might want to include? How do you get it done?" Yeah, that's a good question. So I actually partner with a company, it's called Exchange Traded Concepts, and they do all of that work for me. So all of the regulatory, all of the trading, all of the accounting, like everything that it takes in the background to actually get a fund listed and to actually, you know, service it throughout the day. I basically pay somebody to do that for me. And then that way I could focus on number one, designing it and number two, marketing it. Um, and the term for that in our business, it's, it's what's called a white label firm. Like, um, so they create your product for you, but like all the branding is yours. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I partner with a company like that. So you're not taking order flow. <laughs> yeah. No. Nope. Yeah. You know, that's actually, it's funny. That's a really good question too. Like, there's a, there's a lot about ETFs that's like really misunderstood um, by people. And like one that I face a lot by being like a smaller company and, and my funds being smaller is, um, you know, sometimes when you launch them, they don't have a lot of assets and they don't have a lot of trading volume and people assume that they can't buy them. And so ETFs are what's called open-ended funds. And um Basically what that means is as people buy them, they grow in size. And one thing that's really cool about ETFs is they look exactly like stocks when you look at them on you know, your brokerage or whatever, but, um, but it's actually totally different. So a stock, you've probably heard that you know, famous term for every buyer, there's a seller. So if you're buying a hundred shares of Merck, somebody's selling a hundred shares of Merck. ETFs look like that, but they're actually totally different. In with an ETF, what's more likely going on behind the scenes is when you're buying or selling the ETF, you're trading against what's called a market maker. And so let's say you buy a a thousand dollars worth of an ETF. What's happening behind the scenes is that market maker in real time is taking your thousand dollars and reinvesting it in all of the underlying stocks of that ETF. So like an ETF, like you could have an ETF that only has like 20 million in assets in it. Well, if somebody wanted to buy like a hundred million dollars worth, you could probably do that because of that open-ended aspect. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, that market maker will just take that money and reinvest it in the underlying holdings. That's that's something that like, since I've been doing this for years and years, I have to explain to people every single day, um, even sophisticated investors yeah. don't always appreciate that. And um, it makes it really hard for smaller ETFs like mine to kind of get off the ground because sometimes people see them and think they can't be traded, but um, it's, you know, that's not true at all. I, can I ask a silly follow-up question then? If it's, if it's open-ended like that, how does, how does price elasticity work? Right. If you can, if I can just, if I can just buy things without people having to sell them to me, where does that, where does the bid ask spread come in? So that market maker <clears throat> knows exact. So the, like for the can for my China funds, a little more complicated because those are foreign securities, but for the right. cancer fund, it has 30 holdings in it. And those 30 holdings are trading on the stock exchange live while the ETF is trading. Okay. 
And so because of that, that market maker, and it's really a computer, it's not like a person, it's like a right. supercomputer. That supercomputer knows exactly how much it's going to cost to either buy or sell those underlying holdings. Um, and so depending on the size of the trade, like the bid ask spread that you're seeing is probably for, you know, a few thousand shares. If you really wanted to buy a hundred million, you know, they would quote you a totally different price, but um, because those stocks are trading in real time, that market maker knows exactly how much it's going to cost to buy those stocks or mm -hmm. to sell those stocks. And so mm -hmm. they can, you know, they can create the bid ask spread because of that. And that's another really good question. Like um, it goes back to like, you know, like a stock, if if you're buying a lot of Merck, the price of Merck is going up because there's a set amount of shares. Um, with an ETF, it's really not like that because you're buying the underlying holdings and your trade is probably so small in that context that you're not yeah. really moving the price of the underlying holdings. So okay. Why, so let me let me ask, let me play slight devil's advocate. So if you're a retail investor um, or you work with an investment professional, why would you choose an ETF over individual stocks if you have enough to, you know, to invest? Yeah, so number one, we're talking biotech here. And, you know, even the best biotech companies can have major setbacks and blow ups. Um, and so, you know, most people, I think, go too risky in biotech and end up getting burned. Um, so, so, you know, that it's the most volatile, most risky sector of the stock market there is. And so this is just trying to make it, you know, a little more diversified and a little, a little less risky. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, for, you know, who this is really marketed to, you know, these are people who, who, might not even know the companies. You know, I like to say like, you know, remember when Jimmy Carter was like cured by Keytruda of, of his melanoma <laughs> yeah. that, you know, had gone to his brain. That's kind of who these products are for. You know, a lot of people are reading about that in the newspaper going, yeah. my gosh, this makes sense. Like yeah. I get it. Like I'd love to invest in this, but I don't know, besides Merck, you know, I don't know who the, what companies are working on right. this or whatever. And so the fund does all of that work for you. You don't have to you know, you don't have to do the research or, you know, take the risk of investing in, in individual companies. The, you know, the fund does all of that work for you behind the scenes. Yeah. You mean you do? <laughs> <laughs> Brad does all the work. Um, yeah. We've actually had several good questions, um, a couple on the science and then some more on the business. Um, I'm going to ask one. Dennis Purcell says, Brad, congrats and thanks for your contributions to the industry. How yeah. do you think companies are handling this downturn? Um, well, let me start by saying I have the highest regards for Dennis Purcell. It's great um, to have a question for from him. And it's been a while since I've seen him. He actually creates the index um, for an ETF. So he knows all about this industry and has been very successful in it. Um, you know, Dennis, I'm really worried about the state of biotech. Um, you know, biotech was the first sector to turn down. Um you know, we peaked in February of last year. And so we're well past a year and a half into this downturn. And I think a lot of smaller companies, you know, I was at a lot, I was, I was in New York last week um, at a few conferences and I met with a lot of small companies and saw them present and everything. And I'm really worried because I feel like a lot of them are crossing their fingers and praying that the sector you know, rebounds like it has in past years. But, you know, this is arguably the worst downturn the sector has ever had. You know, there was the genomics bubble in the year 2000. Mm -hmm. And like, technically, this one is actually worse. And I don't think things are going to get better um, in the near term. And I do think companies need to get creative about raising money and frankly, surviving. Um, and so, I guess the answer to the question is, um, I don't think a lot of companies, I don't think enough companies are being thoughtful enough that like, this could be bad for a long time. Um, and if, 
your strategy is to wait and pray that, you know, things get better and the financing windows start opening again, that is not a strategy and um, yeah. you're going, you're going to get burned um, eventually. So my suggestion to companies out there is that I don't think things are going to get better for, you know, for a while. Um, I don't know how to put a time frame on that, but like, you know, if we're meet, you know, this time next year, like we could be the same place we are right now. So yeah. you have to be very thoughtful and creative about trying to bring in money to like, you know, help you survive. Yeah. It's an interesting dichotomy between the public and private sectors and biotech, really, because you have, I, I don't know how healthy everything is on the private side, but there's a lot of companies that raise a lot of money and all of the venture funds basically reloaded over the last couple of years. So there is a decent well, I believe, of private capital for those companies to really kind of wait out until an IPO window opens again. But the public companies are, you know, really in a much more difficult spot because they're, you know, they're, they're very public and you know exactly what they have. Their investor base is different. And right. it's, it's harder, I think, for the sector broadly to do something creative. I think there's always going to be uh, CEOs and management teams that are able to get a really good deal together or able to say, yes, you know, bet on us, we're going to get through this. But as a sector, it's hard to kind of broadly generalize that. Yeah, absolutely. The strength of the private markets has been the most shocking thing to me over the last handful of months. It feels like every single day there's a venture capital firm that announces like a multi-billion dollar raise. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you're exactly right. Like if there's no IPO market to eventually provide an exit for you, I mean, obviously it's going to open up again someday, you know, um, but uh, you know, if there's not a robust one, I mean, we had a hundred IPOs last year, you know, think about that. I, I don't think that's going to happen again for many, no. many, many, many years or, or should happen. Um, so my guess is that, you know, it's just a delayed reaction. The Like you were saying, I think the public companies feel it first because everything there is transparent and in real time. And I think eventually there's got to be a delayed reaction where some of these, you know, private funds, you know, start to feel the heat next. Yep. Um, qu question, um, staying on the, the biotech ETF, it says you buy a basket of 30, but then five new companies look good. Any way to add or subtract over time? How do you rebalance your fund? Yeah, so that's a good question. So we do that every six months. Um, okay. So I have what's called an index committee. And um, every six months we get together and review it and, you know, do all of those types of changes. So how volatile is that list? I mean, how so, so just a, an academic question. I mean, how much do <laughs> things really change every six months in, in the top 30? Yeah, right? Are uh, there... Yeah, it's like four or five companies go okay. out, you know, go out and uh, are replaced healthy. by four or five new ones. Yeah. Yeah. If it's, you know, if it's 15 every six months, that's probably a little more volatility than you want, but four or five seems about healthy. Yeah. And you actually want to minimize that because one of the, one of the nice things about ETFs is that they're tax efficient. And so if you do too much trading like that, um, yeah. it starts to chip away at that tax efficiency. Yeah. So can we shift gears a little bit and talk about China? Because you, you know, and I, I still think you're probably considered early on uh, on the China beat here. But you were, you were basically, you know, reporting live from China about the fact that there is a vibrant sector. There's good science. There's good companies. Um, I, I'm guessing back in 2015, like this before anybody really was there. I think people probably still had a lot of preconceived notions about what Chinese biotech would look like. And, you know, I think the, you know, maybe you can provide a little clarity here, but I think the fact that you had kind of the, the legend and J&J &J results is here, there's a lot of validation of that China market uh, that's happened in the last little bit. Yeah, so I don't think it's really appreciated the importance of what's going on there. In the in the two years before COVID, I went to China 10 times um, to really wow. get to know the, the companies and the investors yeah. and everything. And um, <clears throat> excuse me, the way to think about China <clears throat> is before today, <clears throat> 
excuse me, before today, there was no biotech sector. China's pharmaceutical market was almost 100% generics based. Mm -hmm. And that started to change about three years ago. And there's a handful of things that have really catalyzed that change. So China has this long-term program called Made in China 2025. And the goal behind that is to take the economy there to the next level and to, and to support like industries of the future. So pharmaceuticals was part of that. And um, in 2018, China joined something called ICH. I had never heard of that before, but it's really important. It was created by FDA, EMA, and the Japanese regulator to harmonize regulatory standards um, across the globe. And in joining that, uh, China, like drug development in China, like started happening to these global standards. So if you were a Chinese company, you now kind of knew the playbook of like how to develop a drug, like based off of, you know, getting it approved in Europe or the United States. But as a stock market person, the thing that really interested me and the reason why I created this next fund is before 2018, biotech companies couldn't list on the stock exchanges there. Um, you had to have a certain amount of revenue and profit. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, you know, most biotech companies are, um, you know, development stage and don't have that. So they couldn't even list on the stock exchanges. So the Hong Kong Stock Exchange in 2018 said, hey, you know, this is a key industry of the future. Like, it, we've got to start playing in biotech. So they changed the rules um, and created something called Chapter 18A, which basically allows true development stage, you know, pre-revenue, pre-profit biotech mm -hmm. companies to list on the stock exchanges there for the first time. And so since they did that, there's been a boom of biotech IPOs there. Um, mm -hmm. There's been over 30 that have taken advantage of that new rule. And, you know, just to give like an example, in, in 2020, if you judge IPOs based off of the amount of money raised, eight of the top 10 largest biotech IPOs in the world were in Hong Kong, not wow. in, in New York. And I say that to people in our industry, you know, who, who are really in the know, and they're shocked to hear that statistic. Yeah. So think about that. Eight of the largest, top 10 largest biotech IPOs did not happen in New York that year. Like, that's really amazing. So think of what those companies have a chance to turn into one day. The idea here is, you know, this is like investing in the U.S. biotech sector when it was just starting. Yeah. Genentech right. and Amgen and Celgene were just, you know, new IPOs and nobody had ever heard of them. Um, so the idea here is the next Amgen, the next Celgene, the, the next Genentech, you know, may come from this region one day. And so to transition from being a 100% generics based, you know, no innovation pharmaceutical market to you know, pivoting hard to innovation um, in a market that's that's that important, um, you know, that's something special going on. And it has global implications. I always tell companies, like, even if you don't care about China and, like, you never want to hear the word China again, I, I understand it's controversial and everything, but um, this is eventually going to be a competitive factor um, in Europe and the United States. It already is. And so, you really have to get to know like what's going on there and how it might affect our industry more broadly. Yeah. And Brad, well, those, I was gonna say, those companies that you're talking about that listed in Hong Kong, and th those aren't dual listings, those are sole listing, right? On the mm -hmm. Hong Kong exchange. That's right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you think about it, the almost every major large biopharma company has a research outlet and a team in China. Right. And if you think about the things that drive value in biotech, you know, whether they're major transactions or partnerships, there's an entire ecosystem set up in China for those things that are actually going to happen, whether it's for the Chinese market specifically or for the global market. But the engine is the engine for value creation is there. Right. I think yeah. it's like you said, it's a, it's something that just isn't isn't as noticed from a trading standpoint. Yeah, the, the head of research at AstraZeneca 
and by the way, AstraZeneca now gets 20% of its revenue from China. It's the large pharma with the biggest exposure there. Um, the head of R&D at AstraZeneca had a really good quote in the Financial Times about a year ago regarding this. He said, in past years, as we develop drugs, China used to be like a one-off thought. It would be like a special situation that like maybe this drug like, you know, is particularly suited mm -hmm. to China. And he said, now when we develop drugs, for every single drug, we think of the China strategy, you know, relating to that drug. And um, I think that's, a, you know, I think that's very smart of them. And, and yeah. I think that other companies will eventually get there as well. Now, there's challenges. The, <clears throat> the biggest challenge, I think, by far is drug pricing in China is very low. So they have something there called the National Reimbursement Drug List, the NRDL. You know, China is still kind of the ultimate one payer system. Mm -hmm. And just to give an example of how low drug prices there, we've been talking a lot about the PD-1s today. So, you know, the list price of Keytruda in the U.S. is like 170 k um, the government in China pays less than 10,000 um, for PD-1s there. Um, that's how stark the, the pricing difference is. And um, so, you know, a lot of people are worried about, you know, making money there for some things like that, that, you know, especially like PD-1s that are in highly competitive categories. But, yeah. um, mm -hmm. but you know, the market there is just so huge. It's a billion and a half people. Right. And, um, you know, that's, with that size of a market shifting to innovation, there's a lot of opportunities for biotech companies to leverage that. Yeah. And Brad, are companies or companies with product on the market, right, that are that are active in China, are they importing um, therapeutics or are they manufacturing them in China for the um, for the Chinese population? Yeah, so a little of both. So, you know, it's this shift from generics to innovation has happened very quickly. And what most companies have done, like from the outset, is had a very like in licensing model, or or they're de or they're developing and manufacturing drugs that are like fast follower drugs, like PD ones. Yeah. So a lot of that has been happening over the last three or four years. But as they've been doing that in licensing and fast follower stuff, they've been doing their own discovery work. And eventually that's where all of this is headed is, you know, inventing new medicines on their own. And so a lot of that discovery work is now reaching the clinic. And I think you'll see a shift away from that in licensing and, and fast follower um, model into, you know, more of a, 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 of a model of innovation. And I, one thing that like really amazes me is, um, you know, for the last three or four years, we've been talking about all of the in-licensing work. And if you've been following the headlines lately, you're starting to see the opposite direction start to happen. So like, you know, for example, Merck, which, you know, has been in the news a lot about potentially buying CGEN. Well, in the meantime, a couple of months ago, they licensed two ADCs from a China company. Um and you're seeing a lot of that, like AstraZeneca and licensed a bispecific antibody um, from, from a company called Harbor Biomedicine. So you're starting to see the licensing like shift direction and go from east to west, which is you know, really amazing how quickly that that's starting to happen. Do you think we'll see any regulatory headwinds to that effort? Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, so... We already have. Look, China is the most controversial thing there is in the United States. Like it, like for some people, like they just don't want to hear it, and and I get that. Um, so you know, President Biden last week signed a biotech bill about bringing manufacturing for um, for the biotech sector back to the United States, and. My analysis of that is that it's more about like biofuels and things and less about medicines, although they do want um, to have more APIs um, developed in the United States. And so the CDMOs and CROs, like the Wuxi Biologics um, of the world, their stock price were, re were really hit hard last week. Um, and so I do think that our in our industry, you'll start to see 
you know, backed by the government, more of a trend on being, you know, self-sufficient and like, you know, made in the USA, um, you know, focus more than there has been. And then um, on the, on the FDA front, there's been a couple of headlines. I think that, um, I think that people have overreacted to these. Um, so like there was a Chinese PD-1 that, um, that Lilly tried to get approved in the US for lung cancer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it was really high profile. The problem with it is they only had China data. There was no US data. And um, so the FDA decided that that wasn't a good thing, which I agree with, um, mm -hmm. and they rejected it. So one major learning is if Chinese companies want to get their drugs approved in the US, they have to do multi-regional studies that are, you know, US centric, like everybody else. And I agree with that. I think that's a good thing. And I think ultimately it will, you know, fold China companies into the mix in the right way. So I don't view that one as controversial, that was kind of, you know, it was, it was kind of written about that way. Yeah. It was written as, as like, a, oh, wait, are we not going to allow any sort of, you know, evidence of Chinese studies to yeah. support an application? That's right. It was kind of written as like, you know, U.S. will never approve a China drug, like, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and that's not true. Um, that, like, that was a total misread of, of what that was. Yeah. We've, we've so, actually, oh, go ahead, Derek. I was, I was actually going to hit the, uh, the, the last one here. We have a good question. on, And, and I think this hits to a lot of people's fears, right? And the, the question is, if they're, if they're talking about China IPOs, you know, how to detect kind of, you know, a Theranos or, or something else out of, out of China, right? I mean, it, it's the manifestation of general distrust in the Chinese market, right? Do you see that as kind of a risk here? Or is, is this sophisticated enough where, you know, you think China is, do you, do you think most of, of what you see is real? And is that kind of just really xenophobia when it comes down to it? No, it's definitely a risk. And, you know, to be self-serving, that's why I created an ETF. Like in, in that case, we have 60 <laughs> holdings. So if one does right. turn out to be a Theranos and yeah. blows up and goes to zero, then we'll live to see another day and it won't, you know, affect mm -hmm. us that much. Um, I will say one thing that's that I was surprised to learn as I like got into this is like, the stock market listing requirements there are actually way more strict than they are in the United States. Like if something goes wrong, like you're held personally responsible if you're like the CEO or even like the banker that takes the deal public and everything. And so one thing I've learned is like, you know, if you, if you're a Chinese pharmaceutical company, if like, you know, if there's like a drug that's like some has some problem on the market like the ceo of that company is going to jail <laughs> um so the the personal responsibility factor is actually way higher there but yes um you know bad things happen there you know just like they do here um and you have to be yeah. careful and not you know expose overexpose yourself to you know one or two companies yeah we definitely don't have that that is not that is not a thing here yeah. um well, why don't we switch gears a little bit? We have about 15 minutes left because I want to talk about, uh, you know, the Clubhouse program that you created with, uh, with Daphne and Chris, just because it was, you know, throughout the pandemic, uh, I think it was really, you know, it was something that everybody looked forward to uh, on the weekend. Um, and for, so let's, let's kind of start from the beginning. Why don't you just uh, give people a little bit of background on, you know, what it was and, and how you created it. And let's kind of get into the story here a little bit. Yeah. So this so clubhouse is an app on like your iphone or, or android and basically the idea behind it is it's like a voice conversation with like a huge audience and uh, i think the easiest way to think of it is it's like a conference you know you have like a stage with speakers and then you have an audience and and in this case it's all voice because it's on your your cell phone and so it's just a very easy way to have like a discussion. Um, so, you know, two years ago when this app came out, we were all kind of locked in our houses, unfortunately, due to the pandemic. And um, Chris Garabedian, 
who's kind of a mentor and a business partner and just, you know, somebody who I really look up to. Um, he was really on it, I think, you know, faster than anybody. And he was like, hey, you know, we're all stuck in our houses. Why don't we have like a couple of these clubhouse sessions where we just talk about what's going on in biotech? And so we started doing that very informally. And then um, after a few weeks, it started to pick up an audience and, you know, a little bit of steam. And um, Daphne Zohar, who's the CEO of Pure Tech Health, who is somebody who is also amazing and, you know, who I really look up to, um, asked if she could join Chris and I as like, you know, one of the discussants. And, um, you know, that really gave it like, you know, more legitimacy and formality and so we decided to do like a clubhouse event every Sunday at four o'clock. And, you know, we thought it was important to have it like same day, same time. So it was easy for people mm -hmm. to remember. And for almost two years, we did these every Sunday. And the, the way we did them is like for the first half hour of the show, Chris, Daphne, and I would go over like the week of biotech news and kind of you know, say everything that happened and maybe give our opinion, uh, you know, about certain news items. And then we try to get, you know, just like you guys do with these, these breakfasts, we try to have like a newsmaker or somebody interesting as like a special guest, um, you know, to talk about their experiences. Um, so yeah, it's very rewarding. Um, we did that for almost two years. And you know, now that the world is kind of, you know, thankfully normalized, you know, President Biden, of course, uh, two nights ago said the pandemic's officially over. <laughs> yep, all done. <laughs> over. All over. Um, Oof, it just became that. really difficult to, to give up our Sundays. Um, so we made an announcement that it's going to change. And um, I don't know what it's, what the new version of it is going to be or, or whether or not I'll, I'll be a part of it. But in some way or another, um, Biotech Clubhouse will will likely come back um, just at a, an easier day in time. I, I will say from, from my perspective, I think the when you guys did the kind of pre-conference roundup things, whether it was ASCO or any of that stuff, that those were those are so I, I'm not gonna say were, those are so good. You have, you know, you get more people, it's a rich, rich conversation. Um, you know, you've, you've got kind of the right people in the room to talk about that. You can sit there, you can listen, and you can learn. The conversation is great. And you have people that absolutely, you know, know the rundown of everything that's going to happen here. It's, it's basically, if you're going to one of those conferences, it's almost like, you know, required listening. It's fantastic. So if you were even to only go forward doing that, I think that's a super valuable thing. Thanks. Yeah. You know, I think the thing that made it so great was just the caliber of people that showed up in the audience and participated, you know, like we'd have like Bruce Levine, um, you know, the co-inventor of CAR-T there. So I always feel, you know, sometimes I feel weird. I'm like on stage talking about CAR-T and like the guy that invented it is like <laughs> listening to me. It's like no pressure. <laughs> Just jump in anytime, Bruce, really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of people like that. And, um, one thing that was always very re rewarding for me to see is a lot of times we'd invite these, you know, special guests like CEOs of companies and things. And then in future episodes, we'd see them in the audience. And um, that was always very rewarding that, you know, they they found enough value in it to just, you know, come back and, and listen to it themselves. So that was pretty cool. Um, speaking of which, Chris Garabedian is in our audience today, and he's also <laughs> been on our program before. And then um, I thought this was funny. An anonymous attendee suggested, is it a coincidence that Clubhouse Sunday afternoons ended at the beginning of football season? Question mark. And then they have a <laughs> uh, go Chiefs after that. <laughs> I Were can you neither, typing that yourself, Brad? <laughs> I can neither confirm nor deny. <laughs> I hadn't even put that one together. No, it's, 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 it's interesting. It's a good medium. And, and I think one of the interesting things here is that our industry kind of requires this dialogue between, you know, disparate pieces of, of the audience, right? You, and you have people that are really educated, you know, heavily science educated on the finance side, people on the science side that really understand the marketing, the market piece. You know, we have this industry that 
really kind of cuts across individualized, you know, job functions and and science and finance and everything here. And I think that level of that level of dialogue is really important because in a lot of ways it's it's there are these two inextricable forces that both move each other, whether it's the science side or the finance side. They're very they're very closely tied together. Yeah, absolutely. I think everybody I think everybody plays a role. You know, there's a lot of pieces to this industry and um, you don't have to be like the world's leading scientist um, to make a difference in biotech. As I said, I'm not, I don't have a science degree. I am a, fi a finance person and I've just, you know, succeeded on this, you know, I, I've just done well on the science side through hard work. Um, you know, reading a lot of papers and going to a lot of medical meetings and talking to a lot of experts. And um, I think if you do that and really put in that work that, you know, anybody can really pick it up. Yeah. And um, speaking of science side, I wanted to circle back to, we had a couple of questions that we just didn't get to when we were um, talking earlier. Um, there's uh, one question about what are the limits of IO? It says are, there are probably cancers and patients who won't respond. And so therefore, do you think there's an opportunity for a non-IO oncology focused ETF? Um, yeah, so you're right. <clears throat> so some can't, some tumor types are what we call an immune desert. Um, and so it, it seems that nothing is going to, going to work on the IO side. And, um, you know, could you create a broader oncology fund that, you know, encompasses everything sure i i wanted to create um an io fund just because you know i believe in it so strongly and and you know i have expertise um in, in, in that area but sure i i do think you could there's other funds that could be created yeah well bro broader than that you had said that you're actually looking at starting new etfs i think you you teased kind of neurology at the beginning here but do you see you know, do you see other sectors re within biotech really as kind of ripe for that? And it's funny that you mentioned either neurology or or uh, or neurobiology or or anything to do with uh, with the brain, since for ages, you know, people stayed away from any sort of development for any brain disorders. Yeah. So, so first of all, I should say that um, you know, like like a lot of biotech companies out there. Um, I'm trying to survive right now, like with the <laughs> stock market as difficult yeah. as it is. Um, I wish I was in a position to think about, you know, launching new funds, but, um, you know, things are really bad. And, you know, just to be honest with you, I'm like, I'm like a lot of businesses out there in survival mode. So that's kind of where I am right now. But yeah, in terms of like other areas, neuroscience, without a doubt, you know, the Aduhelm approval, even though Aduhelm itself was a mess and, you know, turned into like a total disaster. I think that the, I think that that approval um, really signaled a new era of, you know, regulatory regime for, you know, neuroscience type things. And then, you know, there's a lot of great science that, um, is coming to the forefront. Look at Karuna. Um, you know, like mm -hmm. I mentioned Daphne earlier, this is one of her major successes that she, I, 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 you know, she deserves all the credit for. That really is going to redefine how psychosis is treated. That is going to be a mega blockbuster drug. And the science behind it, the muscarinic agonism, um, is just so cool. Um, and so you're starting to see a lot of those things. You know, Amelix just had its second, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it you know its second uh, adcom that you know went well, and and they won the vote on that. And so you just see like a lot of positive things happening in the neuroscience space. Um, you know, CRISPR and gene editing, of course, is you know super exciting. I love companies like Verve. Um, you know, to be able to permanently lower people's cholesterol. That's amazing. I mean, that can yeah. literally extend the that that it is so unappreciated how powerful that is. Like, if that's safe, that could literally extend like the lifetime the the lifespan of the human race. <laughs> like, that's how powerful that potentially is, and it's just yeah. one use of 
kind of that base editing, you know, approach. And there's going to be a lot more things like that. So, you know, I think that like a, a gene editing, you know, type thing would, would be really interesting as well. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's one of those spaces where you actually do the mask on like the bulk, you know, public benefit and it's huge. Yeah. Right? It's just absolutely enormous. Yeah. You know, people always, you know, longevity is like another buzzword right now. Like I kind of feel like when I see longevity companies, I totally don't understand like the science behind it and everything. And like it's super complicated and like science fiction, like. To me, Verve is my longevity play. If you can lower people's cholesterol permanently, that's longevity. Longevity is at least getting to the point where I think the leading companies in that space are talking about what they're doing scientifically, right? It's not just, you know, it, it's 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 not nootropics anymore, right? It's not, it's not, it's not supplements, it's not anything like that. They're talking about fundamentally thinking about the the science. I think they, they probably have a long way to go. But at least now there's some more focused scientific efforts that are genuinely talking about it in pieces rather than just waving their arms and saying longevity and live forever. Yep. Um, we have actually I have a good question um, that it, depending on how long you talk could be a good wrap up question. Mm -hmm. um, it says, what is your biggest or let's say best piece of advice for an early career science interested in an investment career in the future? Um, I would say if, if you're on the science side and you want to get on the finance side, you know, try to work for somebody who's well-regarded in our industry that, um, that can really show you the ropes like a Dennis Purcell, you know, who had, had a question earlier. Um, if you were fortunate enough to work with somebody like him, who's been around for so long, um, and could show you the ropes on the finance side, I, I think that that would be really important. Um, another direction that a lot of t people take that I'm, um, I'm a little less of an ad advocate for is becoming like a sell side analyst, because mm -hmm. with that, you're just kind of thrown into the fire and you're asked to just kind of bring in business and write a lot of reports and you're kind of on your own. So there's a lot of kind of like lions of our industry, you know, like, men and women who've, who've been doing this for a long time. And um, mm -hmm. I would say, go, you know, Chris Garabedian is a good example of that, you know, here too, he's running this ontogeny um, accelerator fund, you know, go work for somebody like that um, who's been there and done that. And you can see how to do investing the right way. You can find Dennis at our New York bio annual meeting next Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> I really thought for a second you were just going to throw email addresses out here. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So we talked about this a little. Why don't we? Why don't we close with this? Right. You have a you have a doom and gloom picture for the the market, right? But I want to I want to get us away from that. So, what are what are some of the things that you think the industry could or should do, or what are some of the bellwethers that you think might lead to an uptick? Uh, again, right? Given, you know, hold, hold any and, and all other kind of macro finances uh, constant, right? What are some of the things that you see coming out of the industry that could actually bring us out of this hole? Yeah, well, the first thing is like biotech at its core is very strong. Like even though we're in a tough moment, like, you know, the core of biotech is there like the way I think about what we're going through, the best analogy I've heard is like, think of the housing crisis. You know, when the housing crisis happened, most people lived in their own homes and like were fine and like were totally unaffected by it. It was like all the subprime stuff that like, you know, had to get, you know, sorted out and everything to like, you know, for everything to heal. That's in many ways, that's what's going on in biotech. Like science couldn't be more exciting or, or you know, or, or more solid or more credible right now. Um, and the core of our industry and just the way that our industry is needed. I mean, one thing that COVID showed to the entire world is how integral our sector is to the normal functioning of society. So at its core, biotech is very strong and has a bright future. It's just like a lot of the subprime stuff has to get cleaned up. Like those hundred IPOs that happened last year, 
Mm-hmm. You know, I'm sorry to say the vast majority of those should have never IPO'd in the first place. And a lot of those companies are going to be in big trouble, like, you know, trying to, to sort it all out. So, so as long as you're focused on like the good stuff, um, you know, I, I, I don't, you, you know, you may not be, uh, you know, affected very much at all. And, you know, the reason I, I, I like biotech so much is I really do believe that like the last couple of decades was about tech and the next couple of decades is going to be about biotech. Um, and in that context, there's going to be a lot of brighter days ahead. It's just, you know, we're, we're, we're going through a pretty tough hangover. You know, we had a pretty big, you know, during COVID, we were on the front page of news every single day and people were yeah. throwing money at our industry yeah. and we're just going through a pretty nasty hangover um, from all of that. And I just think it's going to take a little more time for, for that to sort it all out. Well, we appreciate your time today um, and we look forward to having you back in the future where hopefully we've recovered from the hangover and we're ready to party again. <laughs> Absolutely. Everybody, right. thanks so much for joining us. Um, have a great day and we'll see you next week.